that logo? That, yeah, there. Um, let me tell you about this. Uh, this is um, kind of, this is just what we're going to use in-house to talk about what we do in Ethiopia because uh, we've adopted this region. One of the reasons that I find out that nobody really works in this region, it is the dustiest, driest place in Ethiopia. And it's weird because it's around a lake. You would think, well, we got some water here. But I'm telling you, the dust, number one, they're in the middle of a drought uh, right now. Uh, it's the lake water's about six feet lower than I've ever seen it before on any of my trips. It's, uh, the dust is so incredible that you, you, it's like, if I've never been to L.A., but it's like smoggy L.A. Like, you can't see, the visibility's not very good. I mean, I used to be on the lake shore and you could see the islands. You can't see the islands because it's just haze. And that's how dry it is. Um, but there's a couple of verses in the scripture that just talk about what God does and what God brings out of the dust. And that's really what he's doing in this. This, uh, this shape outline is actually the lake, the shape of the lake, Lake Zwa. Uh, these two uh, red portions right here are two islands. Um, Zadecha Island uh, right here and Tulaguda Island. Um, these two islands are inhabited by a group of people called the Zay people. There's six to 8,000 people in this people group. Um, they migrated down here to this region centuries ago because of uh, Muslim persecution, and um, they settled into these islands. Uh, they are not very accepted in this region um, by people. There's a little bit of racism that exists there because they're not from there, even though they've lived there for centuries. Um, they've started to kind of migrate to the shoreline, um, so there's a community right here on the shoreline called uh, Herrera. It takes about two hours to kind of drive around to get to it. And I made that drive uh, this time for the first time. There's a community right up here called Mekki. And then there's another community right down here called Bochessa. These are not great areas, but it's where some of the Zay people have kind of migrated to to find better working conditions, you know, livelihood and all that stuff. And so I say that because th this is kind of what our target is. Um, the Zay people are an unreached people group, meaning they do not have a consistent gospel witness in their community that, that teaches the gospel found in the scriptures. Um, they are largely controlled by uh, a religion called the Ethiopian Orthodox religion, and um, we can get into details of that later. Uh, but it, it's... It's a, a place that God's called us to. It's a people group more than anything that God's called us to. And um, I wanted to say thank you up front for letting me be gone for two and a half weeks. Um, some of you are like, Dave, with the partners that we've got presenting and teaching on Sundays, you can be gone more often. Um, and I'm really grateful for Cliff Wright. Uh, I love our partnership with Young Life. It makes a difference every day in the schools in Cabarrus County. Um, Sean and Lindsay here at Hickory Ridge, and just there's a lot going on with Young Life. So if you're in that mix, like keep up and, uh, and be aware uh, because God's doing some great things there. But it, so it's great to have Cliff here sharing with us last week. Uh, two weeks ago, if you're here, uh, you got a, a glimpse of Dave Lewis and the Basic Idea Ministries. He's kind of like our off-site staff person. This guy is a high-capacity leader in Atlanta. He's done marriage ministry for hundreds and thousands of couples, okay? And um, we are really fortunate to have him as kind of part of our off-site staff. And, uh, and then the people that God is using and redeeming for his work, because uh, our message here needs to be, hey, it doesn't matter uh, where you're at in your marriage. God's got a plan for it that is great. God's got a plan to redeem all the broken parts of it. And I hope you got that message loud and clear a couple weeks ago. And uh, so I'm grateful for the partners there. Um, what we're doing uh, here is, is just a consistent effort um, that's been going on. So I kind of want to fill you in on a few details and give you a little report. I will say up front, uh, we don't do this for every mission trip we go on um, because sometimes that's all we would do. But honestly, I felt like um, you guys deserve an update because so many of you uh, poured so much, uh, whether you gave you know, and bought a light to give to these people um, or 
Five years ago, you, you know, gave $10 to help build a well on this island. Um, there's just things that kind of culminated uh, over the last five years of work there that I wanted to kind of celebrate and share with you. And so uh, this is kind of the phrase that I, I just felt like God laid on my heart in mid middle trip. And it's kind of like, you know, sometimes you choose a mission. You know, sometimes you get out there and you're like, well, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. But sometimes a mission chooses you. And um, more than anything, uh, that's, that's what I feel like the Lord has given me for this and given us for this. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, we adopted kids several years ago. And through a circum bunch of circumstances, we found out that they happened to be a part of this people group. So we have three kids in our family that are Zay people, if you will. And uh, right now, you wouldn't necessarily know that because they're just great sixth graders that live in Harrisburg. Um, but they have uh, siblings and family members um, who are in these areas. And we didn't go into this figuring out, hey, we, I mean, you know, when you adopt, you don't even know if you're ever going to know where the kids even came from other than just kind of the country. But God, through a bunch of circumstances, kind of led us to this community. And um, it's kind of a mission that has chosen us uh, in this respect. And so I kind of want to give you a glimpse of uh, what you guys were part of. I know a lot of you, um, you know, gave lights or bought, gave money to buy lights. Uh, we got some great partners with some lights, and we got them all through customs. And so hopefully that'll be a great route uh, for us moving forward. But here's a few pictures of us giving out the lights. Um, they're really just an individual light. It's got a little uh, solar panel on the back. It's got a USB charger on there to, uh, to be able to charge your phone. Now, I know some of you are like, it, it is kind of hard to like see a guy come out of a grass hut going, hey, you know, I, I mean, it's just, but think about it for a second. Look, they're 50 years away from ever having a landline. But technology's great because you can put up a cell tower pretty easy about anywhere in the world. And that's what's happened over the last several years. Last year, in fact, I had a really hard time getting any signal on the island. It was just spotty. This year, uh, we're posting live on Facebook from, from the islands. Um, and that's just kind of how this thing is going. It's, it's really going to be interesting over the coming years because of we have a relationship to see what technology allows us to kind of peek into uh, moving forward. But these guys there, um, this is Ryan Morris, and, and we basically, this is on Zadecha Island, the smaller island, and uh, we had the whole community come out so that we could give one light to each household. And so there was uh, about 250 households represented there, a couple hundred, two to three hundred people uh, kind of all around. And um, it was just really an amazing time to watch the gratitude of these people who are receiving something that they just never had the opportunity. Um, I mean, you really ought to just live without electricity. Just Well, some of you did through the storm, right? It was just awful because you had to do it for 18 hours or something like that. Um, you know, it, 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 just what you're able to do at night because you have a light is different. Your whole life is different because of the capacity that you have. And so these people just receiving that, it's been amazing. Look at that next picture. This, this is, I got tons of pictures kind of like this. I mean, uh, guys, I just say thanks because you, you provided us with this experience and I'm trying to share that back with you because you just can't get the gratitude. You can't imagine how thankful they were to get it, but also to just be thought of, you know? To just know, I was telling like, look, our church is thinking about you. We, we, we were planning for this. You know, we've been preparing for this. And when we go back, we're not going to forget you. You know, you're in our hearts. You're in our lives. And that meant so much to them. Um, this next picture, keep going there. Um, I want to skip that one real quick. I'll come back to that one. Cause, so... Um, we did our best to give them a little primer, a little tutorial about how to use solar light, you know, to charge it because it automatically goes off during the daylight. So if you're not careful, you don't know if it's off or on and all that stuff. And so um, 
you know, it's got an on-off switch, but you can just leave it on all the time if you charge it right and all that stuff. So we gave them the best primer we could in about 30 minutes. But still, you could tell a lot of them were like, so we were still kind of walking around the island after everybody kind of gone. And this lady, you know, shoes us over and, and says, hey, and you could tell through our translator that she didn't know, uh, she listened, but she didn't know how to operate this light. And so it was really cool to um, just be with her. And he was explaining everything to her. And, and uh, so we've not been out there on the island at night. Um, but, but I'm like, you know what, let's take a picture in here. And this is inside her hut during the middle of the day with, with the door shut, the grass hut door shut. And it's dark. And I was like, you know, let's turn that light on. And, um, and she was so excited to, to see her hut, you know, lit up. Um, but that did not compare to the excitement of her daughter. Go back to that other picture. This is the exact moment, the exact moment when this girl realized that this will charge her cell phone. <laughs> it's universal, right? I mean, there's some things that are just humanity, and that's how we are, right? I mean, literally, she's like, really? I mean, you could, you could feel it. It was amazing. It was so awesome. I'm so glad we got this picture, because I'm, I'm sitting there, like, just, I probably took 20 pictures of her while, you know, they're doing this, and she's like, how? I mean, you, like, she wanted to know now exactly how this worked, and I've got another picture where, you know, we've, we've plugged it in, we put it in the sunlight, um, there, we're, we're literally standing, the light's coming from the door um, that's open, and, uh, and we put it down there on the sunlight, we plug in her phone, and it's charging, and man, her face is like, man, it is on now. It was just so, it was priceless, honestly, it's priceless. This girl's probably maybe 18, 20 years old, and um, listen, to charge their cell phone, they give it to the fishing boat that comes by daily. And I don't know who's responsible for taking them into town, two-hour boat ride, charging them, and getting it back a day or two later, okay? I don't even know how that works. I mean, why don't you just try it one day, okay? Just, you know, get a cab and say, hey, will you go charge my phone, bring back to me a couple days? You know, I, I, it's just crazy, okay? But communication is just so vital, and it's such an amazing gift that you've given to these people. For every home to have uh, the opportunity for light, um, and it's just honestly incredible. On top of that, um, let's see what the next picture is. Yeah, um, that's not it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, on top of that, here's what you got to realize: they spend 25 percent of their income on kerosene. Okay, you haven't just given them light you have basically given them a 25% raise because they don't have to spend their money on kerosene anymore, okay, just to have light. And they don't have to breathe the fumes from burning that kerosene uh, in their home or in their hut. Um, it's just phenomenal, honestly. Uh, on top of this, from an environmental standpoint, like, you got, we got to keep them from cutting down trees. Now, I'm not an overly conscientious environmental person, but when you're there, you realize how much this is caused by them cutting down trees to burn, to cook their food, okay, and to have light at night. And this is helping that, okay? So in multiple ways, what you guys have done over the last several months in providing this entire island a light is just unbelievable. We also were able to provide light for the island and then the Herrera community that's real close to that, right on the, on the edge of the lake shore. So there's about 250 homes here, and then there was about um, 46 homes uh, in Herrera that are represented there, and we've got both of those communities covered um, with each household having, having a light. Um, but our goal wasn't just to share about physical light. It did open the door for something that I've never been able to do before, and that's to address the entire island. And this is this meeting, okay? There's a bunch of more people sitting over here. It's really still like here's all the guys and here's all the ladies all the way back over here. It's like a middle school dance, really. Um, and, uh, and so you're sitting out there, and, um, you know, we, we 
we were able to share with them the message of Jesus, that Jesus says he's the light of the world, and that if you trust him, if you receive him, you'll never be in darkness. And it was a great opportunity to share with them for about 10 minutes the gospel. And um, after I shared here uh, through a translator, uh, one of these guys over here, he stood up. He said, oh, I, I, we agree with your message. And I know they don't agree with our message. Um, it's kind of a real delicate balancing act trying to work with the island elders who are kind of the gatekeepers. They want our help, but they don't want our gospel. And um, so it's been a fine balance. And, uh, and I was able to say, no, like, now there's a difference between um, the religion that binds you and the religion that is lorded over people that keeps them um, in darkness. Uh, and the freedom that is found in trusting what Jesus Christ has already done and the grace that God moves towards us with. And uh, it was a good time. Um, so that was this, this time right here. Let's show this next picture. Um, this is the smaller community, Herrera. We kind of did the same thing and then keep going. Um, and then this was the greatest part of this whole thing wasn't me sharing the gospel uh, because but the persecution for people who receive Christ, they face more persecution from the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, religion than they do from, from Islam. Okay? So that people who are, want, are about to receive Christ or considering it, they are more fearful of persecution from the Orthodox than, than Muslims, even though there's some from both. But they're, they're not going to receive Christ publicly at like this town hall meeting, okay? And what we did is, I shared the gospel, but we had probably eight to ten uh, Ethiopian partners that we developed over the last several months. And they were there sharing in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And the reason I really wanted to share this one is this is on Zadecha Island. And uh, this is Masella. This is one of our church planners. Um, if you give to support the work here, like our church provides his full-time salary and everything he needs for, to do ministry 365 days a week and so, or days a year. So that's, um, that's Masella, and he's one of the guys that's out there. This is the director of the elementary school that's on the island that has a couple hundred kids that goes to it. And uh, through this conversation, he found out that this guy is a believer. He has trusted Christ. The great thing is in this very conversation right here, these other two guys who are two of the four teachers at the school both receive Christ right here. And so I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Like here's, here's, uh, here's the guys that are, you know, they're, form, they're, they're the teachers of the kids on the island. And, um, and it was really, really cool to see these conversations happening because that's where, you know, an Ethiopian is sharing with an Ethiopian. And it doesn't matter how immersed we are in their culture, we'll never fully understand it. And so we've got to have indigenous partners that we enable and we empower to be there and to do the work that we can even, never even understand. And so that's what this was happening over and over again. Here's the uh, next, next slide. Um, this is the third commu community on the south part of the lake, Bochessa. Uh, we have not done lights here yet, but they invited us to come because this guy, his name's Doshi, he's one of our partners, and we also provide his salary uh, full-time and everything he needs. And he's just started in this area. And so he's got about six people, six to eight people in his church that he just started four months ago because of your support, okay? And he invited us out, and we drove. Wow, this was the hard trip for me anyway. Um, and we, but we came out here, and you could tell, like, the whole community is like, here we go. Shared the same thing, had the same conversations. But it was different here, and they started calling people out. I mean, somebody's like, hey, you, you, you need to receive Christ. I mean, they're, they're not speaking English, but you can kind of tell this is what's going on. And you're watching it like, wow. Like, and, and, you know, somebody would be like, mm, you know, like this. And then, okay, you know, I mean, it was just 
like that was happening apart from us. Like that was going on among them up here. And 19 people uh, out of this little community received Christ this day right here. Um, and we, you know, I look forward to, you know, doing some light projects in the future uh, for them. And so that's kind of what happened there. Let's show the next picture. Um, this is a picture of last Sunday morning at about 7 a.m. after we did a baptism. And these are all the people that were baptized. Um, yeah, it's, it's really good. <laughs> they, um, um, there's also the leaders, church leaders, and our partners kind of mixed in there. Um, uh, Derek and I are in there, if you can find us. I'm not sure we kind of blend in. You know. um, but, I, like, there's two ladies. There's a lady and kind of a teenage girl. They were baptized, and I still hadn't quite figured out why... Um, I don't know, maybe God's calling some of you ladies that you need to share the gospel and maybe the ladies will respond to you in a way that it's just, it's a male-dominated culture. It's just a growth curve that they still need to be on. And I don't know if I'm stepping on something, but um, I found out that um, there's several other people who came to be baptized from that Bochessa community, but they got there an hour late and we'd already gone. And so, um, but I want to point out a few people here. Um, uh, this guy right in front of me, and this guy beside me, and this little guy right here. Uh, those three guys are, are Lemmy's uh, brothers, my son's brothers. And, you know, the gift of being able to baptize uh, your son's brothers is just really unspeakable. And so uh, it's a priceless gift that you've given me to be able to participate in that and to be able to be a part of it. And guys, that's just because you know, like, like, it's not just I, have, we have loved them, okay? A lot of you years ago gave money to build some wells on this island, and that's the first, you know, plowing up the hard ground. So a lot of you have been a part of this process that has brought us to this, this point. And... Um, I just want to say thanks. It's just unbelievable. At the same time, these two guys, I just found out, these two guys are, are uh, Lemmy's cousins. Um, there's four brothers that uh, three of them have died, mostly because of waterborne illness, the best we understand. And um, I'm, the other one still remaining alive, accepted Christ last year and was baptized. And then... Um, you know, here are uh, Lemmy's cousins, and uh, they're part of this. So it's just really, really special, and I really just want to say thanks uh, for that. Here's the, keep going, um, this is uh, Teraku, uh, Wes Werku, um, that's Lemmy's uh, closest sibling is older than Lemmy. He's in 10th grade. I think he's about 15 years old. And then he has another brother who's, I think, 17 years old. And that brother is in seventh grade. And the reason he's still in seventh grade is he, he just didn't get to start school because he had to work um, when his dad passed away. And so um, just a really amazing time of being able to celebrate. So that's that. Um, this is the message, I think, that I shared. Uh, and I just want to kind of share it with you real quick. Dear brothers and sisters, this is from Romans chapter 10, where Paul says, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. And I just said, look, guys, the longing of our heart is that the Zay people will be saved. And Paul says to a group of people who are very religious, he says, you know what? I know what enthusiasm you have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. Guys, there's an enthusiasm that some of you have for God that you inherited from your parents or you grew up with or you have just picked up on that is not about the gospel at all. It's not about God moving towards us with grace. It's not about him requiring only from us faith. It is about you earning and scratching out a blessing from God through your own effort. And that's what Paul's saying is misdirected zeal. 
says, I know what enthusiasm means, but it's misdirected zeal, and that's what their religion is. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. You see, guys, humanity comes up with all kinds of ways to get right with God. Spiritual leaders abuse that feeling that people have, that need that people have to be right with God, and they come in and they say, you know what, this is what you need to do. You need to do this, 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 and they create checklists that dictate your behavior. And they basically say, hey, if you'll check all these boxes, then you're good. I'm saying you're good. And that's the margin that a spiritual leader uses to come in and deceive. And it's not the gospel. It might produce a lot of spiritual activity on your part. But ultimately, it does not bring people to freedom. It enslaves them. And it deceives them into thinking they're right with God. Listen, the only person that gets to say, Who's right with God is God. The only person that gets to define how you become right with God is God. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. So refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. It feels good to actually do something. It it puts us in control, actually. And we kind of earn it a little bit. We have a part in it. And a lot of you, you've got to stay clear on this time and time again. The longer that you're a Christian, the more you go to church, the more dangerous it is to kind of subtly believe that your relationship with God is based on your obedience. And you're checking the boxes. And that is not the gospel. It's free. It's through faith. It's your belief. And all of that is because of Christ. For Christ has already accomplished this. If you could do it, Christ died for nothing. If you could earn your way to God, Christ would not have had to go to the cross. Do you think God would have sent Jesus to the cross when Jesus prays, God, if there's any other way Please, not this. Do you think if there was another way that God would have still sent Jesus? And let me tell you, every time you feel like you can claw your way into a relationship with God, you're basically spitting in Jesus' face and saying, your sacrifice on the cross is worth nothing. Because there's another way. There's not another way. Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, as a result, all who believe him are made right with God. And that's the message, that's the very message about faith that we preach here at Venture Church. It's free. Because Christ has paid all of it. And if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord. See, it's free, but it'll cost you everything. It's free, but God is going to be the Lord of your life, okay? If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. This is God's way. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in them will never be disgraced. Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a great feeling, great confidence to be able to say to people half a world away, they have no, nothing familiar with me, not even the same language, but just to know that it doesn't matter. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why? Because Jesus has done it for all of us. He's done it for you. He's done it for me. And we got to remind ourselves about it, no matter how long we've been a believer. It's not our effort, guys. It's not our effort. It's God's work in Christ. That's where our hope is. And that's the message that I was able to share with them. Here's a, a well, there's a couple more pictures here I want to share with you. Um, we've got some great partners. Um, last year, we left, and we just didn't, the partners that I'd hoped to develop just didn't materialize, and 
We just didn't have people there daily. This guy, his name's Muhammad. He's a former Muslim. I met him six years ago. He went out to the island with us when we adopted our kids and brought them home. And I had heard that he just started a church two months ago in Herrera, in this community on the far side. And I thought, I doubt he remembers me. And we spent maybe, we spent one, two days together, two days, six years ago. And so we pulled up um, to this church that's two, two months old. And, um, and he kind of shook my hand. I, hey, I'm David. And he met the other people that he knew that were with us. And then he came back and he, and he looked at me and he's like, David. And I knew he knew me. And it was just, he's like, he told the other guys, he says, I met this guy years ago. I've been praying. I knew in my heart that David and Mindy would come back. And it was a weird, weird feeling. Like, like this is that day. Um, we are adopting him as our new church planter. Um, he gets to spend one day a week at home because his family lives about an hour away and he serves in this community. And so they just built the church there. I'm like, hey, what do you need? He's like, we need to build a house. I need my family like here. And his, the, his mom's house is the, the, part, the property right next to it. And um, so we left him $900 to, that's going to almost cover all of his house costs. And so he's going to be able to build a house there. And um, that is just a phenomenal partnership that we're, uh, we're starting there. Next partner, I've already introduced these guys, but this guy is Doshi. He's in Bochessa. And uh, these are the guys, some of the guys who received Christ uh, that day. And this guy is just a phenomenal leader. And um, look forward to just partnering with him. So when you see these faces on, on Facebook posts with New Covenant Foundation, you just know that because you're a part of this, you're providing what they need every day to expand the kingdom there. And then uh, the other one is Masella. Um, and he's, he's the guy right here. And uh, he's on, from Tulaguda, which is the big island, which is basically kind of the, the heart and soul of the Ethiopian Orthodox. I mean, like, with this, we're going, like, into Mecca. Like, <laughs> we're going into Mecca with Jesus. We're going right to the heart of, listen, this is how deep this goes, okay? Here's my Indiana Jones story for all of you that are fans, all right? I think it's a myth, okay, but I haven't been able to confirm this. And if you look this up, and if you look Tulaguda up, and you look Zay people up, like Wikipedia or something, you know how reliable that is. Um, <laughs> it's purported that they hid the Ark of the Covenant. I'm just saying. It's possible, okay? It's as good a theory as any, all right? And that it's on this island, in the monastery that's on the big island because they were the protectors. I've been into the outer courts and into the inner courts of this monastery. They won't let me into the Holy of Holies. I've got to create a distraction next time I'm there somehow. All right? I won't touch it, okay? Because bad things happen when you touch the Ark of the Covenant. Um, but, like, it's just this, I don't know, it's just, it's a religion that has just held power over people. They don't even teach the messages in language that anybody understands. It's, Masella is from that island. And he doesn't live there right now because of persecution. But we're praying that he, he starts a church on Tulaguda. I mean, this is crazy, okay? And so he's one of our partners. Um, so that's, you know, these guys are there day in, day out. So I just want to say thanks. Um, you guys are making a difference. We are almost to the place of, of being able to actually run a trip that, you know, you could be effective and a part of if you're interested in that. Um, I don't want to freak any parents out, but, uh, you know, I think, that, I think that maybe we're going to take a small student ministry trip um, with a few adults. And um, so if God's calling you guys to go to Ethiopia to kind of expand some horizons, I think he's opening some doors to make that a a meaningful, good experience uh, in that, that we're also being good stewards of resources as we take you over there. And so uh, just pray about it.
see what God has for you, all right? Um, I want to kind of turn a corner and spend the next five minutes just kind of getting you ready for what the next 50 days are going to be like here at Venture Church. When I was there, I spoke to, the first weekend I was there, I spoke to 20,000 people. Um, Pretty intimidating environment with 40,000 eyes looking at you and not ever being used to speaking to more than, you know, five or 600 or whatever. And, and uh, I just told them, like, hey, guys, like, when I get back, to me, like, we were at this point in our church, it was just the biggest, the biggest moment, uh, the biggest door that God's opened for us. And, um, and it really has to do with what we believe God's leading us to. And that is we've got contract on nine and a half acres of land on Rocky River Road, close to the 485 interchange, right before you get to Bojangles, right across the main entrance to the emergency center there. It's prime property. Um, We are responsible for buying the land. And we have uh, partners who are going to build all the facilities. And they're going to run businesses, and we're going to meet there in our church. We're going to own these buildings, okay, with them in this partnership. These guys are kingdom-focused people, okay, They're also great business leaders. They're going to make a profit, but they're going to use a lot of that profit to help us become a stronger church and a brighter light in our community. Through our partnership, we're going to own a building that we don't ever pay for. Okay? That's the big picture on this. So our responsibility of the partnership up front is to purchase the land. And so that's what we're after over the next 50 days is the preparation for that. Um, It's $925,000, guys. That's uh, a a gigantic amount of money. But in the big scheme of things, it's the last dollars we'll ever spend on land and facilities in the history of our church, Lord willing. This is what we've been praying for. This is the burden that God's given me 12 years ago. This is why we're still meeting in (laughs) in a school Because God just has not let us do anything else. And here's the moment of time. We're kind of standing on the edge here. And I kind of want to let you know what this is going to be like. Because we're not doing, you know, we're not doing fundraising dinners with envelopes on the tables. We're not doing, um, you know, so-and-so parties. We're, we're We're not doing meetings over at different houses and kind of arm twisting, whatever. This is what we're doing. We want to lead you on a spiritual process where the end, the end of this is this. The end of this is a conversation that you will have with, with God where you just say, God, what would you have me do? How do you want me to be a part of this? And whatever answer the Lord gives you, I'm just going to encourage you to, to obey him, to trust him. And that's it. So, guys, this is a spiritual process. Um, it starts today, really, because we wanted to start with the community day of prayer. We want to lead you to call out to God. We want to lead you to engage God in prayer, in a conversation, and praying for people in our community that need it, for teachers, for gosh knows, our government needs it. Yes, it doesn't matter what you think about, you know, where you come from. They all need it, all right? If you didn't know that, just wake up a little bit, and um, it shouldn't be hard, okay? have to really be spiritually dead to not pray about government right now, okay? Um, but, but seriously, you know, I jumped in at 7 o'clock this morning and prayed for families um, who, who have the challenge of having a child or a family member that, that has autism. And I know how dominant that is in, in this community and how many people I know that, you know, are working through that. And uh, I just lifted everybody I knew up this morning that I know um, is, is wrestling through that. You know, we've got different focus, but all, look, just get in there and pray, okay? So you can go right now if you want to. You can go after, you can go anytime today. Or, guys, honestly, like, I just want you to spend some time today praying. The second part of this starts on Thursday, this uh, BE workshop. And it's Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday. And look, what it's going to be is it's going to be a lot of scripture talking about God's, you know, God's gift to us and our stewardship of it. And then you're going to hear some stories from some of the partners that we have 
of how they've worked this out in different settings. And you're going to kind of say, oh, wow, like these guys got a lot of experience. They've been doing this for a long time. And it's amazing that we have the opportunity to be in, in a partnership with them uh, in this. So that's step two. It's Thursday, Friday, and then it's Saturday. And then step three is next week we're starting a series called All In. And guys, like this is not a time for like, hey, I'm going to do, like, dip my foot in the water and, and try this thing out. I, we are all in on this, okay? And we're encouraging you to be all in. That's where we're heading. And uh, this is how this series is going to go. Uh, next week, you will get a devotion guide. Um, and so what that devotion guide will have in it is a one day a week devotion. And what we're going to ask you to do starting next week, so I'll prep you on this next Sunday, is to fast for one meal. Some of you are like, whoa, I'm promising you can do it, okay? One meal a week, not a day, just, just one meal, like give us one hour of your week. Spend time with the Lord. Go through this one-page devotion and start building your relationship with God. And that's it. At the end of this six weeks, we're going to have commitment time. And, and, and that's going to be the culmination of your conversations with God. So, guys, this is what we're doing. I don't have another plan. There's no plan B here. My hope is that, and trust, is that God would, would draw you, would call you, and that you would respond to his voice, and that you would set aside some time, invest up with him and see what difference he wants to do in and out in your life. I want to share two verses with you while we close. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins, restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. This is just a great promise from God. If we'll humble ourselves to pray. If we will resist the temptation to be, you know, hey, let's engineer this. Let's figure this out. If we will humble ourselves, say, God, we need you. We need your voice. We need your perspective. I need you to, to show me and lead me. And then this is another response from the Lord. Because the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And I hope that as his eyes search through right now in our church over the next 50 days, that he kind of locks in on us, honestly, because he feels hearts that are completely committed to him. So my goal for you is just to lead you to give your hearts to the Lord, to give yourselves to this process, to open your hearts to his voice, and then to put your faith in action and respond to what he's asking you to do. Let's pray. God, I'm grateful for the love that you have for us. I'm grateful for this opportunity that you've opened the door for us. Um, God, I'm humbled by it. Uh, we're kind of sitting on the front edge of a gigantic task. Not really sure how it's going to happen. I pray, Father, that it happens in a way that leads our hearts to trust you more. I pray that it happens in such a way that we look back years from now and are like, wow, that's the time that our faith took on a different level. That we understood your power, your work, your activity, and your partnership and your invitation with us, feeble us, to create something that, that long outlasts us. I pray, Father, you protect us during this time. I pray, God, that your spirit would just empower us, would give us the boldness that we need to trust you with our whole hearts, that we would go all in with you, and that we would marvel at what you do as we do this together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.